they had no sense of night. When the time for the celebration finally arrived it was as bright in the huge cavern as ever. The phosphorescent plant life of internal mimban functioned according to schedules that ignored the unseen motions of astronomical bodies. Having dried his clothes by the permanent bonfire and then dressed again, Luke felt almost himself. Only his neck still bothered him. It ached at the back, where the cowway's unyielding fingers had pressed. Large platters of exotic-looking foods were passed around a series of concentric circles around the pond. The visitors were entertained by endless dancing, made tolerable in spite of the wailing rhythmic music by the truly astonishing leaps and jumps of the spring-muscled cowway performers. Haller pronounced judgment on each platter, indicating which foods were tolerable to the human organism and which were not. What went for man apparently served Yosem Pind as well. Though they did encounter a couple of stomach-twisting exceptions, none fatal. Luke ate with good grace. He considered Haller's evaluations severely deficient in a few instances, but he consumed enough food to please their anxious hosts and kept it all down. While much of it tasted like reprocessed X-wing fuselage insulation, a couple of the subterranean gourmet delights were downright flavorful. He tried to concentrate on these. In actuality he ate a great deal more than he intended to. However alien their origin, the dishes set before him were fresh. They were a welcome change from the steady diet of concentrates he and Leia had been subsisting on. For her part, the princess, seated on his immediate left, appeared to be enjoying the entertainment considerably. Apparently her feelings toward Mimban's surface didn't extend to criticism of its arts. An inquiry produced a surprising response. That's one of the things that's so wrong with the Empire, Luke, she commented enthusiastically. Its art has grown as decadent as the government. Both suffer from a lack of creative vitality. That's what originally drew me to the Alliance, not politics. Politically, I was probably almost as naive as you. I don't quite see, he said dryly. When I was living in my father's palace, I was utterly bored, Luke. Examination of why I found nothing entertaining led me to discover how the Empire had stifled any original thought. Long-established totalitarian governments fear any kind of free expression. A sculpture can be a manifesto, a manuscript adventure can double as a cry for rebellion. From corrupt aesthetics to corrupt politics was a smaller step than most people around me realized. Luke nodded, hoping he really understood. He wanted to, since what the princess had just said was obviously very important to her. From the platter nearest him he chose a small fruit resembling a miniature pink gourd. He bit into it experimentally. Blue juice gushed all over his front, eliciting immediate laughter from Halla and the princess. No, he reflected, he probably never would completely understand the princess. What do you expect, he mumbled, laughing at himself, from an untutored country boy. I think, the princess responded softly, not looking at him, that for an untutored country boy, you're one of the most sophisticated men I know. Primitive music and chanting faded into the background as he turned to her in surprise. Like a missile launcher sighting on its prey, his eyes contacted hers. There was a brief, silent explosion before she looked hurriedly away. Thinking very hard about something he'd hardly dared think about for several years, he bit into the fruit again, more carefully this time. Suddenly his hand opened as if he'd been shot. The pink bulb fell to the ground as Luke stood bolt upright, eyes open and staring. The princess rose, tried to make something of the gaping expression on his face. Luke, what's wrong? He took a couple of unsteady steps. Was it the fruit, boy? Halla looked equally concerned. Boy? Luke blinked, turned slowly to face them all. What? We were worried, Master Luke. You. But 3PO broke off as Luke turned away to stare eastward. His coming, he murmured, every letter resounding. He's near, very near. Luke boy, you'd better start making some sense or I'll have him hold you down and feed you dipples, Halla said. Who's coming? There was a stirring, Luke whispered by way of reply. A profound disturbance in the force. 
I've felt it before, weakly. I felt it most strongly when Ben Kenobi was killed. Leia inhaled in terror, her eyes widening. No, not him again, not here. Something blacker than night stirs the force, Leia, Luke told her. This governor Asada must have contacted him, sent him here. He'd be especially interested in locating you and me. Who would? Halla half shouted in frustration. Lord Darth Vader, Leia mumbled, barely audible. A dark lord of the Sith. We've met before. Her hands were trembling. She fought to still them. A shouting native voice broke the brief moment of desolate contemplation. The music ceased. The dancers halted their gravity-defying leaps and pirouettes. All three chiefs rose and stared at the native running toward the assembly. The runner collapsed in the arms of one chief. A short, mostly one-sided conversation followed. Then the chief left the courier gasping on hands and knees, turned and gesticulated wildly as he relayed the courier's information to his people. Consternation replaced joy among the gathered cowway. Soon the orderly assembly had become a riot, natives rushing in every direction, hairy arms flying, eyes bulging in panic. Food, utensils, instruments were forgotten, were trampled or overturned. Then the chief approached the non cowway celebrants, chattered at Halla. What did he say? She turned to Luke and the others. Humans are coming. Hard shell humans. Down the main passage from the surface. The way we came in. She looked disgusted, angry. Many humans, carrying rods of death. They've already killed two cowway who were gathering food near the exit and tried to run from them. Imperial troops, in armor, Luke murmured with satisfaction. It has to be, given the other presence I sensed. But how could Vader have found us down here, the princess demanded to know. How? Luke was listening to something none of the others could hear, so she turned to Halla. Could our trail in the swamp crawler have been followed? Halla considered the impossible situation reluctantly. Possible, but I doubt it. There were a lot of places where we just about floated across bog, and couldn't have left a trail. But it's conceivable a top tracker could have plotted a rough course through the surface, making use of the traces we did leave. It seems incredible, though. I know all the Imperial terrain traces and none of them are that good. Even if one of them were, the princess rushed on, how could they go from the ruined crawler to the exit for the cowway cavern? How could they know we're down here? Maybe they thought that after our crawler was destroyed we'd seek shelter underground, Halla hypothesized. But I still don't understand how they knew we'd be in this particular cave. I guess I'm probably the cause of that. They all turned to face Luke. Just as I sensed Vader, he no doubt can sense me. He's had a lot more experience with the Force than I have, so his senses are probably stronger. Don't forget, he was a pupil of Obu and Kenobi. He glanced back toward the shaft tunnel leading to the surface of Mimban. He's coming for us. It was not possible for a droid to faint, but C-3PO managed a convincing imitation. R2 chided his companion. R2's right, 3PO, said Luke. Turning yourself off won't help anyone. I know that, sir, the tall droid responded, but a dark lord, coming here. The very thought is enough to make my senses go to overload. Luke smiled grimly. Mine too, 3PO. The two other chiefs joined the third member of the Cowway Triumvirate, started babbling at it. Their chatter was punctuated by innumerable gestures and much waving of hands. Luke had the impression many of the gestures and a good deal of the talk concerned the three humans standing nearby. Finally the chiefs turned and stared expectantly at Luke. Baffled, he looked to Halla for an explanation. He didn't much like the one she gave him. They say that since you defeated their champion, you are the greatest warrior present. I was lucky, Luke told her honestly. They don't understand luck, Halla replied. Only results. Luke shifted from one position to another. 
The unswerving stares of the three chiefs were making him acutely uncomfortable. Well, what do they expect me to do? They're not thinking of fighting, are they? Axes and spears against power rifles. The differences may be great technologically, the princess countered, eyeing him hard, but I wouldn't sell these people short anywhere else. They caught two full-grown Yuzum without any sophisticated devices. I doubt a group of humans could have done better. And they know these passageways and tunnels, Luke. They know where the sinkholes are as opposed to solid ground. The force isn't a geological phenomenon. Maybe we have a chance. The cow would be better off negotiating, Luke mumbled, unconvinced. Sorry, Luke boy, Halla apologized, after a brief exchange with one of the chiefs. An invasion in force is different from a couple of wanderers showing up. They want to fight. Kanu, she smiled, will judge. I wish I had your confidence in Aboriginal jurisprudence, Halla. Don't fight it, boy. Old Kanu did okay by you, didn't he? Luke, the princess pleaded, we have no place to run to. You just said so yourself. If Vader knows you're here, then he probably knows I'm with you. He won't stop until he. She hesitated, cleared her throat and went on. He won't stop, Luke. Even if he has to follow us to the center of Mimbun. You know that. We've no choice. We have to fight. Maybe we do, he admitted, but the cow way don't. They will whether you do or not, Luke, Halla assured him. We've already claimed we're against what the mining consortium here stands for. The chiefs want us to show them we mean it. Luke's thoughts raced crazily through his brain. Occasionally two or three would run into each other, creating further head havoc and making him wish only for a nice, quiet place to hide. But. He was tired of running. Now that he reflected on it, they'd been running, Leia and he, ever since they'd touched the soil of this planet. He grew aware that Halla, Leia and the three Kauai leaders were all anxiously awaiting some response from him. The princess's expression was unreadable. Naturally, he made the only decision he could. In the frenzy of preparation that ensued, Luke discovered that the Kauai were not as helpless as he'd feared. So it was not too surprising to learn that the natives had experienced previous attacks from above before now, both from predatory carnivores and from other primitive tribes. Most of the time Luke found himself looking on in admiration as the Kauai readied themselves to counter the human invasion, rather than proposing suggestions of his own. They went about their preparations with enthusiasm and a grim delight. Luke was thankful for both their competence and attitude. It alleviated a little of his principal concern, the fear that hundreds of Kauai might die in defense of the princess and himself. It was a good feeling to learn that they shared his anger at the shiner suited figures descending from above. Thanks to the tactics being employed by the Imperials, Luke discovered that the princess was too furious to be really frightened. He tried to encourage her anger. Anything that kept her from thinking of Vader was worthwhile. Using energy weapons on primitive sentience, she muttered in outrage. Another gross violation of the original Imperial Charter. Another reason for the Alliance to fight on. The Kauai wouldn't think much of your emoting, young lady, Halla called out from nearby, since they consider us the primitives. And judging by the way Grammel and his toadies have behaved toward the local races, sociologically I'd have to side with our subsurface friends. As the defenders polished their strategy for the coming assault, Luke and the princess found themselves reduced to explaining the capabilities and limitations of the weapons all were likely to face. At least, he mused, it wasn't to be all axes and spears. He hefted his pistol and luxuriated in its lethal weight. It had been one of the weapons taken from Halla and the Yuzum on their capture, now returned to them. Hin had promptly turned and handed his energy rifle to the princess. He explained to Luke that he felt more comfortable with the enormous axe the Kauai had provided for him. Key's attitude was more civilized, and he elected to hang onto his rifle. Or perhaps civilized wasn't the right word. 
He was helping with the emplacement of a net when a reverberating crackle echoed like a thunderbolt down the winding approach tunnel. According to Haller, the invaders were at present about halfway between the cavern city and the surface exit. E-11 trooper rifle, the princess commented expertly, as the last echoes of the shot died away, quarter centimeter aperture, continuous fire on low power only. She fought to shift the heavy weapon Hin had given her to a more comfortable ready position. While their identification of the source of that roar was somewhat less precise than the princess's, the cowway recognized its ominousness. They embarked on a final frenzy of preparation. A call came from a series of spread out forward scouts. Cowway started to vanish before Luke's eyes, moving, jumping, secreting themselves where no hiding place seemed possible. They disappeared into crevices and cracks, into the ground, slipped into holes in the cave ceiling, froze behind false flowerstone curtains. Luke and the princess hurried to join up with Halla. Both Yuzum were moving to their predetermined positions, mingling with the less concealed cowway. The two droids concealed themselves out of firing range. Halla concluded her conversation with one of the three chiefs, turned to greet them. How many, was Luke's first question. The scouts aren't sure, she told them. For one thing, the Imperials have advanced hunters out, too. That was the source of the shot we all heard. Also, they're backed up through the cave. But if I have Calway numerology figured right, they think 70 at least. All on foot, the princess inquired. Yes. They've no choice, which is good for us. The tunnel is too choked with rubble and too narrow in many places for even a small personnel carrier to slip through. That's something, Luke observed, trying to bolster his own spirits as much as anyone else's. We won't have to cope with mobile armor or heavy weapons. Halla chuckled. Why would Grammel think they'd be needed? Not against our poor primitive cow way, certainly. 60, 70 Imperial troops equipped with energy weapons and personal armor ought to be sufficient to capture a few poorly armed fugitives. Sarcasm aside, Luke pointed out unarguably. It's going to take more than bravery and courage to keep this from turning into a massacre of our friends. I'd argue with you, Luke boy, the old woman murmured pleasantly. Give me bravery and courage in a time. Just give me one clear shot at Vader, the princess snarled, her hands tightening on the rifle stock. The hatred that flamed in those eyes belonged on a much less fragile face. Save that one chance, I ask nothing of life. Luke looked down at her, murmured with feeling, I hope you get it, Leia. That brings up a distressing possibility, she said later, as they climbed to take up places behind a bulwark of striped travertine. What if Vader doesn't come with the attacking force? He's coming, Luke assured her. The force? He nodded slowly. Besides, as you pointed out before, he knows you and I are here. He'll come along to supervise the capture, he said, then added after a knotted swallow, to make sure we're taken alive. Sighting the heavy rifle over the edge of the wall, Leia muttered forcefully, that's one thing he'll never do. Then she relaxed slightly, her earnest gaze focusing unshakably on her companion. If it should come to that, Luke. Come to what? Being taken alive. He indicated understanding and she went on. Promise me that out of any feeling you have for the rebellion, out of any feeling you might have for me, that you'll put that saber at your hip to my throat. Luke stared at her uncomfortably. Leia, I... Swear it, she demanded, her voice that of a steel kitten. Luke mumbled something that satisfied her. They became aware a cowway was calling to them softly from above. Halla looked down from her position high on the cave wall to their left. Don't you two ever shut up? Hush now, children, company's coming. Silence reigned supreme in the tunnel. Luke strained till the muscles in back of his eyes hurt, but the cowway concealment was perfect. Dozens were hidden within meters of him, but he could detect signs of only a few. Close by and evident were only Leia, Halla, and Key. The muzzle of his rifle protruding like a broken stone from between a pair of huge stalagmites. Of him there was no sign. 
So clear and still was the dead air of the tunnel that Luke heard the metallic pad-pad of the first Imperial troops before he could see them. Shortly thereafter, the familiar robot-like forms came into view. Flesh and blood beneath the armor, the distant figures carried their own rifles casually, at waist level. Obviously, they were expecting little if any resistance. As he studied them Luke realized that the cowway were right, in such close confinement the energy armor would work against the wearer. Such armor rendered the person inside it invulnerable to most energy weapons, save at vital points like the joints and eyes where protection was necessarily weaker. More important, the armor also restricted its wearer's vision. Not so critical in a battle on a ship, say, with its wide, unobstructed corridors. But in the jumbled tunnel, vision was more vital than an extra shot. As if on signal, for Cowway, two on either side of the narrow pathway, materialized silently from invisible hiding places. The two advanced scouts were dragged from view with astonishing speed. Not so astonishing to Luke, though. He'd experienced the power of Cowway muscles. In the resulting silence he thought he could hear the cracking made by limbs and bone through restrictive armor. Nervously, he waited for something to happen. Everyone knew that if the four Cowway selected for the task of eliminating the scouts bungled their assignment, if they wasted even a few seconds, one of the scouts might have time to call to the troops behind him via his helmet communicator. Surprise, the defender's most potent weapon, would be lost. He was still waiting when the single cowway slipped up behind him, so quietly that Luke almost exclaimed aloud. The native made a quieting sound, performed a gesture with its facial muscles which might have been a smile, and vanished as silently as it had come. It left behind two rifles and two pistols, the arms carried by the ambushed Imperial scouts. Luke regarded the little arsenal joyfully. Slipping completely out of sight behind the travertine wall, he disengaged the power pack from one of the rifles and used it to bring his lightsaber up to maximum charge. Then he traded his pistol for a fresh one, resumed his place next to the vigilant princess. We ought to get the other rifle to him, he whispered to her, watching the tunnel. No time, she disagreed reasonably. No telling where he is now. Can't risk it. I suppose you're right. He glanced down at the still half-charged rifle and its fully charged duplicate, plus the pair of pistols. At least we'll be well armed for a while longer than I thought. The rhythmic tread of metal-clad feet pounding rock finally reached them. All thoughts of conversation vanished as the main body of troops hove into view. They were marching cautiously, three and four abreast, as they rounded the same narrow place the two ill-fated scouts had entered moments before. The phosphorescent blue-yellow light of the growths in the tunnel gleamed off slick armor and immaculate weaponry. Closer, closer they came, until Luke was afraid they would march right up to his wall before Halla and the chiefs agreed on the time to attack. A strident, powerful voice boomed out in Cowway. The cavern dissolved into chaos. A waterfall of sound deluged the air where seconds before there had been only silence. Luke felt the noise itself, concentrated and magnified by the cave walls, would be sufficient to paralyze most men. The soldiers caught in the maelstrom were imperial troops. But they were not the emperor's palace guard. They were men and women stationed too long on a backward, desolate world where discipline and training relaxed concurrently with morale. The screams of human and cowway howled through the cave. Bursts of intense light from energy weapons created a berserk cat's cradle of destruction in the bottle down tunnel. Luke found himself firing the pistol over and over. Next to him came steady, confident thrums as Leia pinched off bursts from the heavy rifle. Higher up, Halla and Key began pouring a murderous fire down on the mass of confused, densely packed troops. Soon they had to slacken their fire and pick targets with more care as the cowway began erupting from beneath cloth concealed with sand to pull startled troopers into hidden pits, or coming out from behind half stalagmites, or dropping from crevices in the ceiling. Seeing friend and foe inextricably intermingled, Luke charged down the slight slope brandishing saber in one hand and pistol in the other. Despite his admonitions, Leia had discarded her rifle. Pistol in hand, 
she was rushing after him to join in the hand-to-hand -hand combat. She passed him feet first, her kick all but decapitating a dazed soldier who didn't turn quite fast enough. It was hellishly dangerous in the tunnel, what with energy bolts crackling wildly in all directions. Luke cut through the armored legs of one soldier before the latter could bring his pistol to bear. Without realizing it, he then swung blindly backward. The blue of his saber intersected a beam fired point blank at him by an imperial rifle. Turning, he barely had time to utter a silent thanks to Ben Kennedy. The trooper was so shocked at the apparent coincidence of having his shot blocked that he didn't react in time. Thinking something had to be wrong with his weapon, he readjusted it to compensate for the imaginary fault. As he swung it upward again Luke jabbed him through the sternum. Turning, he plunged back into the thickest fighting. He was hunting for one figure. It finally showed itself, standing aloof near the rear of the fighting crowd. Vader! Darth Vader! A wounded trooper charged him and he had to pause to deal with the more immediate threat. But the Dark Lord had heard him. Surprised, the giant black shape activated his own saber and strode into the mob, trying to cut his way clear to Luke. The princess was also trying to fight her way through the crowd. But she was not heading for Vader. Instead, she was moving toward a stalagmite shattered at the top, a she-falcon flying for her prey perch. Under the direction of Captain Supervisor Grammel, about ten of the troopers climbed for high ground, intending to set up a covering fire the entire length of the tunnel. They achieved the summit of the small ridge and were lining up their weapons on the crowd below. Like hairy projectiles, Hin and several cow ways dropped from hiding places above. Roaring with delight, the huge Yuzum grabbed two of the armored troops at once, banged them together until their armor started to crack at the joints. Meanwhile, the muscular cow way wreaked havoc among the other soldiers. Vader paused in the midst of his fighting, angrily evaluated the way the battle was going. He shook a threatening fist in Luke's general direction, then turned to the shaken officer nearby. Grammel. Reform all survivors at the surface. Yes, my lord, the distraught Captain Supervisor acknowledged. Using his multiple channel helmet unit, he signaled the retreat to his remaining troops. Small clumps of soldiers began to break contact with the cow ways, started rushing for the surface. Luke was startled to see how few remained. The soldiers were pulling back in good order. At that point one of the cow way chiefs hiding high above rose and signaled. His order was relayed up the tunnel from one concealed native to the next. Several cow way pulled on a vine cable. Their action sent a pinned stalactite weighing several tons plunging from its eons old growing place. It landed with a titanic crash. Half a dozen soldiers were mashed beneath it. Further reduced in number, the troopers started to panic, to throw down their weapons and sprint up the passageway as fast as their armor would permit them. Most of them ran under the nets which waiting cow way dropped on them from above. Those same nets had held against Yuzum. The troopers who lay flailing at the confining strands had no chance at all. Leogana reached the top of the pinnacle, lay down across it and positioned the heavy rifle she'd retrieved. She fought to focus on a single, black-clad figure striding relentlessly and without panic up the tunnel. Vader was surrounded by Grammel and a few remaining soldiers. She couldn't wait. Soon the Dark Lord would pass from sight. As she activated the trigger, Vader turned and gestured to the several troops lagging behind. A powerful beam of energy struck him in the side, sent him spinning to the ground. Leia smiled. Her joy turned to disappointment when she looked back through the blunt telescopic sight. Vader had rolled over and was beating at the smoke issuing from his left side. There was a gaping hole in his protective cloak and the black armor beneath had been partly melted away. But the full force of the energy bolt had missed him. The Dark Lord got to his feet and seemed for a second to be staring straight at her. Then he was moving again, still not in panic but with considerably more energy, up toward the way out. Frantically the princess re-aimed, fired, just as Vader passed from view. The bolt exploded against the lowest part of the ceiling, 
annihilating rock and mineral but doing no damage to the evil figure beyond. Well, darn, she said softly, irritated at herself. Picking up her pistol and leaving the rifle atop the stalagmite, she started to pick her way downward to rejoin the fight. There wasn't much fighting left to rejoin. Caught completely by surprise, the soldiers had been decimated. Now the remnants, helpless and dispirited, were being cut down methodically by the victorious cowway. Those who tried to break from the fighting were picked off by well-aimed bolts from Key and Halla. She found Luke stalking wild-eyed among the carnage, trying to dissuade the hooting, yelping cowway from reducing the wounded to small pieces. Breathing out the nausea of battle, he jerked around and glared at her when she grabbed his arm. Forget it, Luke, she advised him softly. Leave them alone. They're killing the wounded, he cried in anguish. Look at them, look what they're doing. Yes, it's almost human, she commented, although the Imperials would have been a little neater. You approve, he said accusingly. She didn't reply, merely stared back at him until he sagged, utterly worn out and saddened. I'm sorry, Luke, she told him gently, but there's very little in this universe that rises above the mean and petty. Maybe the stars themselves. Come, she urged him with a cheering smile, let's find him and Key and Halla and the droids and celebrate. You go, he told her, pulling his arm free authoritatively but without answer. There's nothing here I want to celebrate. She looked after him as he went striding off through the residue of battle, ignoring the cowway intent on their massacre, drowning in his own unknowable thoughts.